individual support that we provide through our responses to your email inquiries. While we are a volunteer organization, we cover other expenses through membership dues, donations, and sponsorship. If you believe in our cause and have the funds to do so, we urge you to become a member if you're not already one. Tonight, we'd like to take a moment to highlight and thank some of our sponsors. The first sponsor that we're going to highlight is Behavior Solutions for Children and Families. Dr. Terry Brooks is a behavior therapist who works closely with parents to implement evidence-based parenting strategies to support kids in becoming the best versions of themselves. Her approach starts with helping parents establish a positive reinforcement system and effective discipline system strategies, and then moves to teaching children the skills they need using the established parenting system as the basis for ensuring generalization and the use of those skills in real life and not just during therapy sessions. Our second sponsor is Essex Education Group. And we are an executive function practice that works with students ninth through 12th grade and also college. All of the coaches with Essex Education Group have at least a master's degree, are special educators, and have extensive background in ADHD and executive function. You can find out more about our offerings by going to the website that is listed at the bottom of this slide. Tutoring for Success is our third sponsor this evening. Tutoring for Success offers expert tutoring, both remotely and in person. We support all academic subjects as well as academic coaching, which includes help with organization, time management, and motivation. We also offer test prep for SAT, ACT, and SSAT. This year, we're providing support for distance learning as well. We've helped thousands of students in the Washington DC metro area since 1994. Our final sponsor this evening is the Ross Center. The Ross Center is a comprehensive outpatient practice that provides optimal treatment for anxiety and mental health. Their team of experienced and highly skilled psychiatrists, psychologists, and addiction specialists collaborate to deliver a full spectrum of sophisticated psychiatric and, psych and psychological services for clients of all ages. They've been providing world-class treatment to those who struggle with anxiety and depression for over 20 years with offices in New York City, Washington, D.C., and Northern Virginia. And now I have the, the honor to introduce our keynote speaker. What you're looking at are the remainder of our sponsors who will be highlighted throughout other lectures. Tonight, we're going to hear from Dr. Catherine McCarthy. Dr. McCarthy is a board certified child, adolescent, and adult, adult psychiatrist who specializes in the treatment of children and adolescents with ADHD, depression, and anxiety disorders, including generalized anxiety disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, social anxiety disorder, and panic disorder. She attended UVA for her undergrad and medical schooling, did her residency at Duke University where she was named chief resident, and then completed a fellowship in child and adolescent psychiatry at University of North Carolina. Dr. McCarthy has supported thousands of children in the DC area and has been named to Washingtonian's top doctor list since 2008. She has even been named the top doctor in all of DC. All of her honors speak to her brilliance, but you have to see her in action to really understand the support, strength, and hope that she offers her patients. While she's nationally known and quoted in many publications, we are incredibly lucky to have her shepherding our children in the DMV because her knowledge and support makes their lives exponentially better. We're so grateful to have her join us this evening and I know we will learn more from her because of, learn more because of listening to what she has to share with us. Without further ado, 
I'm proud to be able to introduce you to the one of the most brilliant people whom I know, but also one of the kindest people who I have the honor to call my friend, Dr. Catherine McCarthy. It's too, too kind and I, I'm gonna try not to cry, um, but thank you, that is too kind. Um, and, and we'll see if I cry because I'm not good at the technology piece. I'm gonna try to share my screen. I'm hoping that that worked and you're now looking at a calming picture that I put at the front of all of my lectures of what I um, planned many years ago after a decade to go to New Zealand and now would be something else to be there. But since this talk is something about how we have to be changing our perspectives um, about how we help our kids and ourselves with ADHD during the pandemic, I'm um, going to, well, let's see, hold on. Not able to get my stuff in gear. Hold on, I can't change my, give me one second, let me, ah, there we go. It worked. That was a little anxiety provoking. I don't know what's going on here. That, that, the other slide was, was what I took the other night of the Potomac um, in the effort to change my perspective about how, of being able to appreciate things at home and not being able to travel far away. Um, but the title of this is Adjusting Our Perspective to Help Kids Manage ADHD During the Pandemic. Um, I am so honored to be here uh, as I was saying to the um, folks as we were getting this organized um, technologically before you, um, all of you logged in, but I, I, I love Chad. Chad is my favorite of all the um, uh, nonprofit mental health support and the fact that it joins professionals and parents and in, in the way that does, there's, there's actually no, no organization in the mental health field that I, that I adore more. And to be asked to speak is just um, something else. And a lot of these slides actually come from uh, Chad national and international lectures um, that I've borrowed um, that have, have blown, you know, just, just blown my brain through the roof. So in any case, we'll move on. ADHD was hard enough already. And I have to say of all the, you know, there's so many people, of course, suffering the pandemic. So to compare suffering is is a bit is a bit much, given that all the people in the hospital and the over 200,000 people that have been lost. But when I look at populations of families that are really struggling in the pandemic, um, I would put families of kids who have uh, families who have ADHD in the family have, having it super super tough already. And we already, as all of you, you know, well know, since I know this is such a well, you know, educated audience, get the, all thanks to Chad um, and, um, you know, all of the people involved, is that we already knew that thanks to, you know, Dr. Philip Shaw down the road, who I heard speak when he presented this very study the very first time at a, uh, my very first Chad meeting, and it was before 2007, where he showed that there was this three-year lag approximately of kids who have ADHD, and that, um, and that by age 18, some of the kids starting to catch up, and he was able to say in a very professional way, not the way I say it, which is, you know, Tom Cruise can take a hike, the ADHD is real, but pandemic plus ADHD is awfully hard. And there's so many ways that ADHD is hard in the pandemic. All of us, and I'm going to talk about brains that aren't just um, with the diagnosis of ADHD, but all of us have a tougher time through the screen. And you know, all of us, whether we're on Zoom meetings and especially kids, to sit there during this um, during the school online, are have a dickens of a time staying focused, whether or not they have ADHD. So that is one pandemic necessity that's already hard. Impulse control, um, you know, being part whether someone has inattentive or not, usually some level of impulsivity. We can usually frontal lobe wise hand, handle it okay if it's just a kid in front of us who has braids that are tempting and you want to pull them, but you just don't because the teacher's right there. And so we have that frontal lobe inhibition helping us contain our impulses. But if we have a younger sibling in the desk next to us at home with web-based learning that's making a little annoying noise, we might just whack them um, because we don't have that inhibition at home. Um, hyperactivity, I, one, one thing I'll talk about is my big concern is that kids aren't getting the micro movements that they need of being able to go between classes, go, you know, if they just are fidgety, I need to get some water, I need to go to the bathroom, going like I did to make many, you know, runs to 
sharpen my pencil to move and having to sit there and be on screen and be counted in attendance without movement, even the little ones, is just brutal for kids with ADHD in the pandemic. Um, self-regulation, and there's, um, I could go on and on about self-regulation, especially emotional regulation, but goodness gracious of all the things we need to, in this pandemic that is going on and on is having a decent fuse so we don't blow up at people and get so irritable that we say things we don't mean. And certainly self-control, and all of us will have more um, control when we're around people that aren't our family, um, as in teachers, we'll, we'll, we'll try to to put on our best front as best we can, whether we have ADHD or not. But when it's parents, all of us, you know, let loose at home, is including kids, um, not having that inhibition to control as well. Um, the the with that lag in that front part of the brain, I would argue that you know the prefrontal cortex, where that's the you know primary in that lag, not this exclusive lag with ADD, is really what's helping get all of us through the pandemic. It's the part of the brain that helps us stay rational. And, uh, and think about the bigger picture, helps us not go into extremist thinking um, and see the middle ground between the black and white, um, the part of the brain that helps you know, regulate our emotion. And is that um, regulator, I'll talk about a little bit more of the, I've always point to the front part of the brain of the emotional parts. It's the part of the brain that helps us not just be in the present moment. And if we were just in the present moment through a lot of this, we would feel horribly depressed, but we have the ability, thanks to our frontal lobes, to think about how things pass. And there've been horrible times in all of the course of human history that have passed and that this will pass. And with that being able to see the bigger picture. So it's really, you know, a big piece of what's getting us through. Um, with that, and I won't go on and on, I love to talk about the prehistoric brain and how we are wired like cavemen um, still in our brains. But there's some, some things that are prehistoric brain that really, you know, that just right there back in March when this all happened um, that, that, that all of us experienced, whether um, having ADHD or not. Oh, and I'm sorry, I, I use ADHD and ADD interchangeably, which is such a um, nomenclature no-no. But um, since I, I, I heard at one of these major conferences, the APSAR conference, that they're thinking of changing the name yet again, it'll probably be something super fancy like executive function something. I use them interchangeably because I do that in clinical practice, but I know that's a no-no and I apologize for it. But with our prehistoric brains, whether we have ADHD or not, we are wired for anxiety, we're wired to survive, we're wired to react, we're wired with our fight or flight response, and we're wired to be on the mood and not sit there in Zoom lectures all day. And with that in March, all of us felt that absolute panic and had that all happening. And that's what had people who are right now figuring out the vaccine, swing into action, pulling all-nighters, taking this seriously, that, that, auto, that, that part of the brain that sees that something's an emergency and swings into action. Um, as I want, you know, even though this is what I see all of us, whether we have ADHD or not, I want to talk a little bit more about what I see as having happened to all of our brains in the pandemic. And it is relevant to ADHD and helping your kids in the pandemic, but it also is relevant because it's what is, I believe has been happening to all of us, parents included. So the pandemic brain I see is having had four doozies all at once and continuing to have them um, as we here are just at the beginning of October, seven months in. So one, trauma and shock, which I'll go into now, and all of us remember that time in March, whether we date it to March 15th, March 16th, some of us might have been there in masks at the Harris Teeter at 6 a.m., getting that weirdo text that said everything's going to shut down. And we went into panic mode because it hit us out of nowhere. We thought it was going to be something different, some of us. And we all got that amygdala just blasting off, giving us panic response. And we swung into action, got groceries and toilet paper. I was one of the few people that didn't take the toilet paper seriously enough and had to have my son at college take some from his dorm when he was sent home a few days later and scour the area. But we were all in reaction mode using our amygdalas in that prehistoric vein for what it was meant for. But then what continued to happen is that amygdala kept on going because it was a chronic trauma, chronic shock, which gives us, puts us on high alert and affects our ability to function. This lecture, and this was pre-pandemic, this was one of, besides Dr. Philip Shaw's um, lecture, 
on showing that three-year log was one lecture I heard at, a, at another meeting. And I noticed she's on the board of National Chad when I was looking her up to give her credits. But this genius at Yale, who I would love to be friends with, Dr. Amy Arnston, showed a couple, just a couple of years ago about stress, like what we experienced back in March and what we're still experiencing, creates an ADHD-like profile, whether we have ADD or not. And that's where this is taken from her um, diagrams. She has a great um, video that I snapshotted stuff from and hoping that if she ever sees this, which I'm sure she won't, she would forgive me for since it's brilliant stuff, but that during stress and when all of our amygdalas were staying on and wondering, you know, what would happen and every day getting bad news and worse news and not knowing what would happen, that a that emergency part of the brain literally from her molecular data, looking at the sympathetic nervous system, shuts off that front part of the brain, which is that part of the brain that of course is our free prefrontal cortex and allows us to to think logically and stay in control. So with that, all of us, whether we had ADD or ADHD or not, started to have symptoms of ADHD. And we still do periodically, depending on our circumstance and our brains um, to some extent. So it affected our ability to think about the bigger picture and using logic to know which way was up for the bigger picture and to calm ourselves down. It literally was shutting down our, the front part of our brain. And with that, with shutting down the front part of our brain more on a chronic level, I made up this term, by the way, dopamine dimming, since all of you know, especially you know, all of you as kids might take medicine for attention or yourselves, it, the, one of the main ways these, med these medicines work is by increasing dopamine and ADHD is seen as some dysregulation of dopamine and some other stuff. And by having our frontal lobes more dimmed, all of us started having lower efficiency of this stuff. And that's where a lot of us would be like, I don't know what day it is, you know, is it Wednesday, is it Friday? We just, every, every time blurred, time blindness that Dr. Russell Barkley talks about, feeling foggy, having less motivation, you know, not doing that Pulitzer Prize winning novel or learning Spanish or, you know, Marie condoing our closets, just starting to get a little more of that teenage meh and not necessarily, not necessarily suppression, but just meh. And that's what happened over time to a lot of us that also can make us feel bad about ourselves, but gives us a taste of what it's like to have a touch, a touch of itsy bitsy ADD. On top of the loss in trauma, and not the loss, sorry, the, grief, the trauma and stress and the stress response was certainly the grief and the chronic grief. Um, and any of us, you know, all of us can have, have things that we've lost. Some are huge. Some people, of course, have lost in the greatest way of loss, and it is just incomparable. And but others of us have lost whether graduations, not able to get married, and lots of weddings missed, not being able to see grandparents summer camps, sports, just loss after loss after loss, combined with this fear of foreboding of more losses to come. And loss in the Kubler-Ross kind of way. Uncertainty, which we're still having because it's not ending. Um, and we are not wired for uncertainty. Like I said, we're wired for survival. We're wired for anxiety. We're wired to be fearful, but we're not wired for uncertainty. And this chronic uncertainty of, ah, even though we've always known life is uncertain, but it's in our face all the time of no solid ground with the situation changing every day, not being able to answer questions for ourselves or for our kids about how it's all going to go and how it's going to end. And then with that, with kids, and this is getting to the piece of the ADHD, with with. Dr. Barkley, you know, his, his great, you know, podcast and his great stuff on his website that I listen to sometimes when I have long drives, um, his definition of ADHD being time blindness, that when with ADHD and that frontal lobe um, lag, we, 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 you know, are just kids or, or ourselves if someone, if an adult has ADD, are much more in the present moment, not able to see that bigger picture. So with uncertainty and with life being hard and with not being able to see friends and with having to give up so much, some of the kids um, are, are, you know, can only see the world as bad in that moment because they can't see beyond the present moment. On top of that, too, with, um, AD, with kids with ADHD having trouble with delayed gratification and wanting it now and wanting to have answers now, we don't have those answers. So it's extra hard for them. And then lastly, with that uncertainty, the fact that, you know, that front part of the brain is what helps us see the middle ground, having the, such all or none thinking, it just feels all bad as time and we can't see, see the positive. Finally, 
in this four doozies that I've coined for, for the pandemic brain, having a limited coping skills menu. And I think this is, you know, of course, hard for every human on the planet, but so hard for kids with ADHD. And that usually when we have, you know, really bad stuff happen to us, we've got a ton of things we can do in this 21st century to distract ourselves. We have great coping stuff, whether it's things if school kind of stinks for us, we've got other things that we can have as things that we feel good about, you know, whether sports or things we create or arts or friends, all these other things. And not having our usual menu item list and having such a limited menu of what we can do is, is harder for kids with ADHD. And also because kids with ADHD crave novelty. And currently any of us who's raised a kid with ADHD, which um, in all honesty, you know, I think um, having, a, being a doctor, I'm gonna out myself here, um, who having a, a child with ADHD, um, one of my kids has, even though we were trained in medical school and in residency that you don't have to have kids that have those things to, to be able to treat people well and with good training and keeping up with things, um, you, can, you can do a decent job. There's nothing, I, I never need to be humbled, but there's nothing more humbling than being on the other side of 504 and IEP meetings and, and, and doctors doctor's offices to, to give you a taste. And I, I think um, as much as it was so hard for her and for all of us, it, there was so much to be gained as a doctor. But this I'm bored, that's what, the reason I went on that tangent is that I'm bored, I'm bored, I'm bored. And with just being at home and not having stuff to do and you say like, go outside, go outside. Well, there's nothing to do outside. That's, that's so hard for kids with ADHD with not being able to do things that are new and fun and intriguing. And certainly with the allure of the screen that always is not boring um, is, is extra tough. And then finally at times, and not to get, you know, big, big downer here, but all of us feeling our, lo losing our locus of control and powerless. And then with powerlessness, we run the risk of feeling that we're losing hope. I'm going to touch on, and then I do got to keep mindful of the time. And I also meant to say, I'm not going to get through all my slides. And I decided I just wasn't going to worry about that and give you all of them for later. And rather than cutting them down, I would just get through the most important things that I think are useful for tonight. Um, but there's other ones there. So if I run out of time, someone will cut me off and that'll be it. But I wanted to highlight that the, the reason I have this um, microphone, which I don't know, because since March 15th, I have not been taking new people, but um, I have been losing my voice because all I do is work pretty much. That's an overstatement, but it's pretty close. And it's this is hard on kids who have ADHD and it's hard on kids and families, period. Um, and so I wanted to touch on what's happening at least thus far because it's pertinent to you taking care of your kids from the indicators we have from some early um, research done in May. And of course the impact to kids depends on their developmental age, what their risk factors are, do they have history of anxiety, depression, family stuff, what's going on in their homes, what's going on in their family. So of course it's variable depending on our situation as it always is. Um, these are some um, slides that just to summarize some of the stuff that has come out about teen mental health separate from ADHD that now since the pandemic, 61% of teenagers feel a sense of loneliness. 70% have struggled with mental health stuff. That's big. Usually 70% doesn't come up in psychiatry. If you don't know the answer in medical school and you think it's high, it's 30% on the multiple choice test. And here's symptoms of depression, 43%. The answer for that on board exams historically is 12.5%. So already, and this was compiled from May and it's now October, um, we have seen real concern. And that's why my voice sounds like this. My voice, it didn't used to sound this way, but it's because um, sometimes I feel like I'm working around the clock, trying to very much rise the occasion. I think I still have the best job in the world, but it's, it's rough out there, as you may know, in your homes. And this is my most concerning slide um, that putting together from all the stuff um, is that kids are feeling that they have to keep their feelings to themselves. They're worried about making us worried. So that's something for you as parents to keep in mind is when kids are like, I'm fine, I'm fine. It's not like you'd be like, you're not fine. Um, but but they, they, they might, be, might be not saying things because they are worried about burdening us. And that's a really big concern. Um, so with that, I am, you know, 
forging ahead and encouraging all of us, which I know you are because you're Chad members, to rise the occasion and we will do our best. And as annoying as it is to think about all that we can control as parents and that it's really our stuff to change and not our kids, parents, I, self included, being on the other side of that doctor's couch office thing um, with my daughter. Um, it's hard when they say, you know, heal or heal thyself and the stuff we need to do as parents. But that's that's what we can do since we can't necessarily expect it all of them given that we're the ones with the mature prefrontal cortex. Disease. So with that, I have put together what I see are the essentials for taking charge of ADHD in the pandemic. I'll focus as much as I can on the first five of them, although I think the second five are every bit as important, but the first five for the purpose of this lecture. So first and foremost, continue treating ADHD. Now, it was all, it all has been quite the, you know, experiment and the experience that none of us ever expected to have in our lifetimes. And initially, I certainly you know, was not gonna, I don't judge anybody. Um, well, that's not true. There's certain people that I think could be doing better jobs in the world. But, um, but um, most of the time, and none of us, all of us judge as humans, but I won't go into that. There's a um, primate instinct to do that. But I'm typically say I'm not someone who judges and certainly as a parent who's been on the other side. But, um, but, but in the beginning, certainly many parents in my practice, because it felt like snow days, nothing was going on, you know, especially you know, having a kid in Fairfax County, I felt that too. It felt like a perpetual snow day. So I was like, oh, let's just stop the medicine. Let's just stop the medicine. And although, as all of you know, ADHD is not all about the medicine and it's multimodal treatment with all the, you know, great, um, great, um, even the sponsors here and the sponsors, I was totally wowed here and um, went to go back and get the list of all those. But um, so it's not just the medicine, but certainly stopping the medicine is not a good idea now because of all the times, just because as I went and talked to you about the four doozies that we need our prefrontal cortices engaged, it's now. And especially kids, whether they have homework or not. And now they do. Now the European guidelines, interestingly, and they, there's been no major guidelines that I could find that made a consensus as quickly as the European group, which did in April. So the only, um, you know, the only you know, major construction is still that I could find published was the European group that in April, and this guy is a wizard researcher. I got to hear him speak live in January, he came to DC, um, and it was absolutely phenomenal. Um, and, and I'm just gonna do a little tangent here, which, you know, sounds like such a, you know, distractible um, thing for me to do, but I wanted to tell you that he is, he, what I learned in January when they had thousands of psychiatrists descending on DC and got to hear him speak is something super important that's not related to the pandemic stuff, but that's coming out that highlights that actually now, before it was with medicines, um, thought that, you know, under, you know, age 18 or so, all the stimulants had the same chance of being effective. Um, and they were generally thought to be, if you tried out different ones, up to 90% response rate. Now, from his research and his group that has nothing to do with this lecture that he presented in January, and I think is gonna be in the publication at some point this year, um, signs that from a massive meta-analysis that before puberty, it appears that more kids are um, more tolerant and Ritalin formulations seem to work better. And then after puberty, Adderall seems to have more advantages and certainly adults. That's just an aside, and I would have put it in a different lecture that I was preparing about ADHD, and then the pandemic happened, and I couldn't do my Hot Topics one. But I think it's important um, nonetheless, so that's why I said it. Um, but he is led the European group that I've gone through the guidelines you know, extensively, and they were published on the CHAD website, and highlighted, one, to continue to treat ADHD, Two, that in the pandemic, the behavioral treatment was one of the most important things to make sure was adjusted given the change in the circumstances. Now, I would never dare to go against an entire European ADHD guidelines group that is published in The Lancet, but I do have some comments about that given that that was in April and it is now October. And to not, to say to not change any medicine, not to adjust medicines, to just only do behavioral stuff, I have 
some concerns about. And so I'm being a little rebel here and daring to say this out loud in public, say it to my families behind closed doors. But, um, but now that it's October, kids are still growing. So their brains are growing. The impact of, of, of ADHD is highly situational. And all of you know, having kids, if you have them at home with online learning, it's a bigger situation to focus with. It's a bigger situation for all of us, and especially with a pandemic brain. And it is, I believe, even though this is not consistent with the European guidelines, but my, my recommendations is that it is important to reevaluate the medication schedule. Not that you change it radically because of the pandemic, but it's even useful in that some kids who say have had their appetite walloped all day long and would never be able to take medicines twice a day to have a trough at lunchtime to get their appetite you know, back, it's a possibility that that might be an option. Now, sometimes that blows up in your face and there's up and down with rebound. But I, I do think that during the pandemic, keeping in really close touch with your doctor because it is so hard with kids with ADHD. It is the, just, just if, if we just cooked up what is the toughest situation for kids with ADHD? It's something like this, being at home all the time, not able to go out, not able to see friends, not having teachers be able to be in the face to, and have all the cues of the herd to, to say, turn in your books, time to, time to do the test, time to study. So that's where the medication, I believe, does need to be adjusted accordingly, and sometimes using it to our advantage not stopping it per se. And some people have found that honestly, and I've had people that were evaluated with me years ago and elected for many great reasons not to treat with medicine and wanting to do other things first, whether from medical contraindications or parental preference or other things going on that have come back in droves. It's sort of been like the, this is your life of my practice. People that hadn't been treated coming back, even grown-ups that hadn't been treated since childhood because it's testing us. And so that's where I encourage you with your own kids to, to adjust the medication accordingly, given the major stress on um, with the pandemic, on, not only on academic, but also social, emotional. Um, there's also, you know, this is, you, I think probably maybe saw from Chad, but it's just a remarkable study just from July that actually um, found that treating ADHD, and this is something I worry about in the college population, actually reduces the risk because of impulse control of contracting COVID. And that's not a surprise, um, but it's remarkable that a study was done with 14,000 patients. That's very powerful. Um, this gets to the parent piece of controlling the things we can. Anxiety, contagious, and that's where all of the work here, even though I wanted you to be able to think about the medication piece and talk to your doctors and not press them to change it, but make sure they know that you're having a tough time. And you don't have to be stoic. Want to make sure that you're well treated, especially with the impact it has in the home. But to the parent piece, anxiety is contagious for all of us. And this is where it is our job as parents to try to be that person. I love this quote of Thich Nhat Hanh, um, And I certainly, when I read this, I, I think about um, the, the Thai caves, the Thai cave, all those kids that were, um, whether it was a year or two ago, stuck in that cave and that incredible teacher and coach that kept them calm and they never feared and had them practice calm and was calm himself and they took a cue from him. And that's the cue we have to continue to take for our kids, especially for kids with ADHD who have such a high risk for anxiety disorders. You get to have the real Dr. Six read lecture in a couple weeks, and I'm going to be part of that, Chad, to hear him um, come to your group because I can never get enough of him. But during my, you know, tough times where I've just gone full throttle at home and been the kind of psychiatrist that you might want to have on nanny cam and see what like the real life of psychiatrist is when I just lose it and I'm human. And um, from being a parent of a kid with ADHD, I sometimes in the back of my head, they hear his voice saying, be a non-anxious presence for your kid. And I feel really guilty, but that's what we have to try our best to do. They're looking at us. We need to be our, a rock of constancy and they see everything. And so we continue, we can't be perfect. We're gonna lose it as I do. Um, we're all human and we're not our best, but they're looking at us in the parent piece. No one likes to hear the parent stuff first, but it's really the most important here. And with that, the old you know, doctor adage of heal or heal thyself, taking care of yourself. 
And with that, all the stuff that I would talk about if I had time about sleep and exercising and lowering expectations, GLK is just gentle loving kindness, the, one of the most important tenets of Buddhism. Um, forgiveness of self, recognizing that we're all doing our best and being kind to yourself, but taking care of yourself, putting aside marital stuff. I'll talk about if I, I hope I have time about the environmental impact. I think I will. I think it's in the next slide or two of, of, of kids with ADHD with high levels of anger at home. So if we have marital stuff going on, if we have family stuff, doing our best to put it aside for now so we don't project it at home and beware of doing the modeling of victimy stuff on our kids. We all are having it so hard. And we have to be careful of that because we're getting all this extra time with them, which means time that they're watching us, that they're taking for their future selves. So meaning that we put aside our past baggage as best we can. If we really can't do that, we need to do it outside in separate places so they don't have to be part of it. Now that we're with our kids so much more, trying to be wary of all the yammering. You know, so much, you know, when kids are busy with school, sports, all this other stuff, they're really not at home that much. And so when they're at home for that hour or two, we yammer like, did you do this, did you do this, did you do this? And we get in this habit so that whenever we see our kids, we just like ask them something they haven't done. It just comes out, it just comes out because we're so used to doing it because there's little time for cram parenting. And now if they're home all the time, we just can do that nonstop and it makes us, you know, really not fun to be around and affects our future relationship, which we got to be very wary of because that's where, you know, one of the things I'm really most concerned with is our parent-child relationship in the future. We have great ability to have this be great in the future because of the time with kids, but we also can really, really screw it up with that having space and boundaries with the, with the marital stuff. And the bad word in psychiatry that we talk about behind closed doors is something called EE, which is emotional expression which is essentially yelling and, you know, the not so nice stuff. It's the stuff that, you know, I was saying if there was a nanny cam to look at myself with it, I wouldn't be proud of those moments. And when I'm on YouTube as a doctor, but kids with ADHD who have lots of EE, that's negative emotions at home, a lot of negativity, anger, in which we all are, you know, shorter fuses. Remember our frontal lobes now, not at their best, um, have poor outcomes. And that's where in our homes now with all of this stuff and with having it so hard now in my new like like thing from this week is this asynchronous Monday in a lot of the schools and just really rough days Mondays are going to be rough um, that we have to be aware of it for for the future um, so with that even though it's not that we're going to be all positive and little Stepford parents all the time like that's okay that's fine that you're hitting your brother but validating that it stinks but not wallowing in it for too long. So it's not that we don't say that it's easy or find all the silver lining stuff. I'm all for silver linings, but it's, it's really hard when this goes on and on for months to be you know, into the silver linings and pink clouds. But validating it, that it stinks, it really stinks big and it's horrible and crying at times, but then we're moving on. Any of you who haven't found Tara Brock, she's someone I would love to be friends with. Dr. Tara Brock is not only a phenomenal psychologist that I'd love to meet, but someone down the street who's the, one of the leading experts of mindfulness. And I think as much as people can listen to her as parents and look at her podcasts and free stuff on her website, it's what we need to help calm ourselves. Watching our own negativity, remembering they're watching us and through our actions, we can tell them to be positive, we can tell them to be kind, but if we're not doing it, we are being complete hypocrites. We all do not really like online learning, but the more we say we don't like it, the more, the worse it is. And we don't have to say we like it, but kids hate a lot of things. They hated homework before. They hated going to school before, a lot of them. And they've learned to adapt. I had, you know, I, I had this thing with masks because I just was always a sensitive person. I always wear stretchy stuff. I don't like tags. So I've always been, oh, the mask thing. I don't want to wear the mask. I don't want to wear the mask. I had a kid a few weeks ago said, you know, it's just like, um, you know, my earphones. I got used to ear, earbuds. And once I started wearing the mask, I just got used to it. And of course, they've got this. And I'm like this mask whiner. So lo and behold, I started wearing a mask like a whole lot to try to get over that stuff. I wear it. I'm a safe fairy person, but just just um, in, in the whole, just not liking it mode. Um, anything we practice, our brain hardwires. Um, 
I got a great quote from um, a colleague of mine who's a school counselor close by um, who always says things beautifully, Josie Woods, that I encourage you to look at. And she said, when I was asking her what I should tell you in this talk, she said, remember, you know, every, everyone's going through this right now. Your child will not have a typical school year, but nothing this year is typical. What helps kids succeed in life is not necessarily covering all the materials in their math class, but their ability to manage difficult times, showing resiliency and being able to persevere. And I would agree with that. Adjusting our expectations and being flexible. Even though talking about this rise to the occasion, you know, being like the, the Thai cave, wonderful, mindful person, Tara Brock, recognizing we're human, setting the bar lower, I honestly feel if we can look at this pandemic that we're going to get through it without, if we can get through it without losses, can we break even um, instead of having expectations, especially of ourselves, that we're somehow supposed to have everything perfect so that we're just not worse off in the long run, knowing that even though kids with ADHD have huge vulnerabilities educationally um, and already had the three-year lag and difficulty with learning, we're in the midst of a world-class hundred year long, hundred years since something like this happened, trauma, and we have to be recognized that we can only do our best. And um, there's a wonderful, um, uh, TED talk on emotional agility. I would just, I won't go into it here, but if you are in the car with nothing to do, listen to the TED talk on emotional agility by one of the top Harvard researchers. And it will, I think it's probably the best TED talk I've ever heard. So helping kids be flexible, especially with that frontal lobe lag um, being critical piece. Now, when I went to my kid's doctor and she would talk to me about how we needed to keep more structure, consistency and routine, I would do my little face like okay and then now they're like ah! you know it just it just just you know it's like I know this I know this but really visual 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 and I was talking about this with a parent a wonderful parent in my practice and I was I was starting to dish out the we need to have structure we need to have visuals and she texted me that she goes you want visuals she has three kids with ADHD I said can I please put this in my lecture and and she has this huge wall in her house because they all have to be schooled from home and they all have very high level needs with ADHD and this is the visual. And I just, I just shut up. I was like, yeah, you win the prize for visuals. I don't have that. Like you don't even want to know what my floor looks like right now. But it, so, but it, it's absolutely true that right now we have to make our homes look like what they had at school. And that's where all of us, when we go to back to school night, we'd see everything so organized at the front and it was just so calming. It's like, Oh, it's so calming to have it all, to know exactly when, you know, every break was, when math was. And that's what we have to do for our kids, whether we enjoy it or not. Um, trying to make things in bursts, trying to make it as visual as possible. I won't go into how to be able to teach executive function. You have that in the next coming lectures by wizards here. And that's what, um, you know, certainly the person that introduced me is, um, you know, but, um, but I, I just, um, but that can't be emphasized enough. But it was something I moaned and groaned in my head about. And when I dish it out, um, you know, it's, it's, I always think of that. Um, boundaries of space and time. Our boundaries ourselves are, lo we're losing them. You know, our bosses can just call us at any time because they know we're at home. They know that they, oh, we can just get weekend emails. Trying to give those boundaries to our kids, trying to give them their space, even if we have smaller abodes of where they have their school, space and time work during this time not so it all bleeds over all of us know the feeling of when we have all these things in the back we haven't done trying to make it discreet and i'm sure all of you are doing an incredible job and a much better job than i would ever ever do um the pfc just like that whole chart that my patient mom um sent to me when i decided to, to tell her to have structure um you know calms us and gives and it and it helps our frontal lobe so for all of us um, having our spaces of time and space with school is calming for us. And since their brains are still, um, still growing in the pandemic, this is our chance to help their brains since their brains are molding in, in our plastic, which I won't go into is my other favorite thing to talk about. All of you know the basics of brain health, the pillars of brain health, exercise, sleep, nutrition. And all of us when we hear this like, yeah, 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 yeah. But this is, and this is what I'll end with because I don't think I'm going to get through the rest, is my, is my, you know, really probably my biggest concern besides the social 
implications to kids not being able to socialize at school. And of course, the academic ones, especially for kids that are more vulnerable. At the tippy top would be exercise, because exercise is important, not just for getting the fidgety wigglies out, but for brain development. And although, you know, there's studies that show certainly exercise is an important component for ADHD, and all of us who raise kids with ADHD know this and treat this. And when the study came out, it's like, I could finally recommend exercise for ADHD, even though all of us knew this all along. And this is a great study that highlights that. My biggest concern is that kids are not getting the gimmies that they had that were just the movements you know, that weren't even sports or extra exercise. So I had one of my patients um, show me what his, um, he had a Fitbit and it was back in, I think like April or May that I had my tele appointment with him. And I asked him to look back to what his Fitbit logged pre-pandemic. And it was typically, and he wasn't even in competitive sports, like 26,000 steps. And by April, May, it was down to 2,000. And he was walking the dog and he was doing things, but not all this going up the stairs, rushing out to recess, going to the bathroom if you're bored in class. All those things I'm concerned about with future brain development, really more than anything. And I haven't seen anything written about this, but what happens with exercise and cardio, especially, and movement, is we get something called brain-derived neurotropic growth factor, which is one of the cutting edge things in brain research. And it's, um, there's a great book written by Dr. Reiti about from, from Harvard about exercise and brain development. And it is what is necessary for brain connections and getting the cortex getting thicker. And I'm very concerned that 10, 20 years from now, we will see impacts to brains developing. I'm concerned about development of chronic fatigue syndrome 10, 20 years out from kids not moving and certainly depression. So I encourage you, even though it's very hard to get kids to exercise, especially if it's like, okay, go outside and exercise. You know, do we do that? I mean, some of us do, but it's hard to do when you have a frontal lobe that's like, meh wants to take the path of least resistance and you know play Minecraft. Um, the, the, the previous rec was 25 minutes, three to four times a week, maximum heart rate. And that's what PE classes tried to simulate. Now we got to think way beyond this because of that 26,000 step to 2,000 steps. And that's why I said it's one of my biggest worries about the longer haul. Sleep has been all screwed up in the pandemic. I think it's getting better with the structure of school starting, but that is that is clearly something that kids not exercising enough. I really see most of the sleep trouble has to do with not enough movement. I sadly can't go into nutrition and humor and mindfulness. And we talk about mindfulness. We talk about, I just have this to like cheer you up and wake you up. I could also wake you up with my various minions, but I, I can't see if you're laughing or just like, rolling your eyes so I won't do that. I do that to teenagers when I think they're not paying attention to me. So um but but trying to trying to keep it keep it lighter, trying to have fun with our kids. If we if we can't get them to exercise, we gotta suck it up and exercise with them. I know that um my um you know great 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 colleague um who has run many a Chad meeting, Sharon Weiss who um, I'm hoping isn't listening to this, but if she was, I would do it just to mess with her mind. Um, she doesn't like the word, I use the word bribe. Um, so I'm using it now just to, just to mess with her mind, but I would bribe your kids to get them to exercise. If, you, if they aren't doing it on their own, you can put it as part of, their, part of their work and say, this isn't important to you now. You at this age don't see this as a priority because this is my job to take care of you and have your brain at its best. And you don't want to do it. I'm going to see it as one of your jobs. Jobs. And I would get Fitbits, I would hold them accountable and have it, you know, traded for screen time. And, and if they're not doing it, you do it with them and you drag them out kicking and screaming. Uh, it's essential for our self-care just as it is for the, them. And the same goes for whether sleep or mindfulness. There's some links to good mindful stuff. The reason I'm highlighting that, because we are like mindfulness, mindfulness, it's for really, you know, for real, you know, just important for brain development. And it's the other thing that helps with that neurogenesis. And especially with our brains going all over the place and swimming all over the place. I just put these here so that you have them. Um, I, I, I encourage all of you, and even if it's with your kids and they act like they're not paying attention, to look at some of the apps about it and do it with your kids every single day. Because our brains won't slow down with this and it's just going to be 
a longer haul. I'll stop there because I know I got to save some time for questions. Um, I'm going to just guide you through the rest of my slides in case anybody cares to look later. I, you know, go into have the social connected is, is the other concern. That's in a duh. And as much as we can come up with even fakey stuff to try to keep those connections um, with other people or outside, we, we do our best with it. But at the same time, some kids aren't meant for doing social stuff on Zoom, and I don't particularly enjoy it. All the you know book clubs or whatever and Zooms I bagged out of, I don't really enjoy it. And so we can't make them. So trying to do our best with it, but don't beat yourself up if your kid's not really into it. You do your best with it, and that's all you can do. I won't go into being safe. I know that all of you are and taking this very seriously. Kids seem to be doing better with the mask stuff than Dr. McCarthy was until a few weeks ago, um, with at least not whining about it and um, lastly being compassionate on yourself I've always wanted to put at the end of a lecture a quote of Churchill because the way I fall asleep at night is I listen I, I read this not listen I listen to I read a few pages of this 2,000 page Churchill book and I'm still on page like 500 after five years something like that maybe 600 but um, I certainly all of us can look to people of the past who got through tough times and know that we'll get through this as well um, and especially when we have kids with ADHD okay enough if there's questions if there's no questions don't feel bad it's okay I'm totally cool with no questions you don't have to feel like you're asking anything so at this point we'd like to ask everybody if you have questions please put them in the chat and we will ask Dr. McCarthy we have one question already for you, Dr. McCarthy. Um, we did have one question. Where did it go? I'm good at this. I'm looking at this, Irene. I'm looking at it now. Okay. But it's it looks ah uh, it looks like we might have more than one now. Let's see. We have one from Patricia. Hang on. Um, hang on. Let me scroll down here. Uh, she says, now that the winter is coming and in usual times, our kids were used to going to the mall, the movies, et cetera, for fun. Do you have any advice on how to replace this fun activity during COVID times where indoor activities are not the most recommended to do and not necessarily imply meeting through Zoom or similar computer platforms? Oh, it's going to be a tough winter. I don't think there's any way around that. I think as much as we can and this is going to sound like nothing one needed to go to medical school for but just from the now there's a huge community of international um, researchers like including that super brilliant dr cortese from italy of who who are experts in adhd and the scandinavians are just all over it and really they're like we've been going outside in the cold and dark for years you know they just they just they just do they bundle up and they get outside and that we need to hop to about it and so i i you know i i would absolutely in this rising occasion we're going to be an outdoor family we're going to get the best outdoor gear we're going to get like foot warmers, hand warmers. We're going to pretend we're in dark Norway or Finland and we're getting outside. And even though you can't do it for so long because you don't want to get like frostbite or something, but trying to do stuff outside, even for shorter bursts, it doesn't have to be long, doesn't, but whether it's s'mores every Friday, if someone's comfortable with doing it outside over a pit or something, you know, just having some routine Routine and ritual hold humans together that, that is outdoors to create some fun out of this. Or bundling up massively with for the people that are lucky enough to have those big screens outside and everyone's with just tons and tons of blankets. Just, just doing outside like the tougher people of the earth do is something I would encourage. I also think, you know, even though it doesn't feel as real to do the Netflix party and those things, just doing it, making it fun, ordering food for people in different houses so that it's fun, so that parents all coordinate together to try to just deliberately, we're going to somehow make fun come from this, even if it's going to be short-term fun and it gets old. It's like, we're doing this. Or board games, again, not feeling the guilt thing about the Zoom, but doing it through the Zoom, doing anything just to, just like, we're going to get through this attitude-wise. But I think it's going to be very hard and I'm worried about it as well. And I, I think maybe this is sort of hitchhikes onto that. Tammy asked, are there any other tips for helping to motivate kids to exercise when they think they really don't need it? And this I, may be more during the day, you know, when they're trying in between. It's so 
hard. And I just, I didn't, you know, I um, called some of my favorite behaviorists, behaviorists today, anticipating, you know, questions like that. And, you know, get that, well, you got to shape and encourage the positives. I honestly, and this may be just like too much of my own personal baggage. I think you got to make it as part of their job and incentivize it. Um, that, that we all are doing our jobs and this is what you have to do. Um, and, and trying to make it, you know, whether it's, you know, you know, that you get one of those, um, you know, spike balls or, you know, just something outside that you go do that you bounce around, you have a time limited. Kids are, it's just because the technology and Fitbits, you can get pretty, you know, they've, they've gone down in price substantially at Target um, to try to make it an incentive piece if they won't do it. Or you go out with them. It's like, we're doing this. Now, I can say that, but when you have teenagers, I can dish that out. Could I get my teenager to exercise when I wanted to? No. Could, and I didn't, you know, my kids now, you know, theoretically in college, I mean, I don't know what college is right now, but it's, 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 it's so hard. So you do your best. You try to incentivize it. Try to talk about it as a medical, like got to do this for our brains, but also you recognize, especially if they're older kids, you know, sometimes like there's, there's nothing you can do about it. You just try your best. But getting out with them as much as you can is, is the best that I can say if they aren't doing that. Now, if you have a full-time job outside of the home and you can't do that, you can't do that. But trying to make it, trying to make it on a, some sort of whether positive reinforcement, bribe contingency schedule, but it's hard. Um, the, Kathy, there's another one from Connie who said that um, their daughter broke her cell phone. I mean, excuse me, their son broke his cell phone and he's beyond impatient to get a new phone. Is there any way to help with this impatience? It applies, you know, more broadly. Yeah. Just using an example. Well, it's it's twofold because I don't know what the age of the kid is, but you know, your cell phone. You know, Fourteen for, years old. Yeah. So it's like your life, your lifeline. I remember once when I was having one of my lovely um, secret doctor psychiatry mom moments, and my I don't know why I was doing this, but I was trying to, as a consequence, get my. I think she was about fourteen year old daughter's phone away because because of not doing so. I don't know. I was like, I'm taking away your phone, but. And I just like, I was trying to get it. And I think I'm pretty strong and stuff. And I couldn't get it. It was like, I was taking away her heart. She's like, no. She's like, I couldn't get, I actually couldn't get it. And of course I can figure out a way to turn it off. It's like a lifeline. So you got that piece. That is their major connection now because they don't get to be at school. And that's, the, and that's their major connection. So it's their, literally what they consider their lifeline. Plus needing to have things right now. Not being able to wait. Like, I gotta have a phone. I gotta have a phone. I need a new phone. And all of us know it's really hard to get stuff from the Apple store. So you remain as calm as you can. You're gonna do a better job of this than I did. Uh, remain as calm as you can. Like, we're gonna do our best to get it. We gotta get the best price. We're gonna try to figure out ways for you to communicate through the computer. We're doing our best. And you don't, even when they keep on bothering you, bothering you, just like, we're doing our best. You say the same thing, like a politician. You just say the same thing over and over. Not in my rapid speech, but just like, we're doing our best. We're gonna get it. Just gonna take some time. You know, these things are expensive. It's gonna happen. And trying to be remain calm. Remember, you're the parent. And even though it is there, it's worse now. And I had no success grabbing it for whatever reason. I remember that night, like trying to get it. Um, but that, 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 that not being able to get things right away, as cruel as it feels, is actually good for their brains. But it's much easier said than done. And especially now in the pandemic. I didn't have a 14 year old in the pandemic. That's right. So there's another question from Leslie, and it says, should we be amending our IEPs, um, our kids' IEP, if applicable, to account for the peculiarities of virtual learning? Great question. I should have put that in my slide set. That's a great question. Um, it's just a question of what they can do. And since now it's been about a month in, we didn't have the data about what we needed. So now, if part of the challenge it depends, I'm not being wishy-washy with it, it depends on the kid. But one thing, and I haven't said this to a school directly, but that I'm you know, concerned about is kids who have to be on a screen where it's just not as personal, especially with ADD being hard enough to focus through a screen, you have to make it personal to have relevance. So one thing just in the IEP, if a kid is starting to just not be present with it, not see the point, because that relationship with the teacher is part of that motivation, is to make sure that they are getting some office hour time, even a few minutes where it's talking directly with the teacher. 
I haven't had a chance to find out how much that is playing out in the curriculum since it's all still new and the teachers are overloaded and kids are overloaded. But that would be one thing that I see is really important is that there's salience and relevance for kids that they have a connection with their teacher. And I'm sure it also is teacher dependent, but that would be one thing. The other piece too is just coordination so that it isn't all on the parent as it often often is with having to organize, figure out the screens. And if you're having challenges and you can't do it, that you speak up um, and just, 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 um, but I, I haven't, it's just a question of the structure of the school and how they're doing it. I think that as much as you can, having meetings, even if you're, say your annual isn't scheduled for the fall, putting it on the calendar is important. That's a great question. If well, I want to give a lecture like this again, I'm putting that in there. Right, and part of that, the, the, one of the final comments on that question was, you know, that, the, that Leslie feels like the poor teacher's, you know, brain's about to explode because there's oh, so much yeah. dealing with too. So, you know, it's not as if you want to push the teacher. No, no. And so that's a really difficult thing for parents when they see the, their child struggling more, but how do you yeah. do it without, you know? You get, you know, I'm sure all of you, and that's where, you know, people who raise kids with ADHD, you know, we have such empathy because when it, through suffering, we get more empathy um, and not that we needed more because a lot of us had plenty to begin with, but just to be from the beginning, as I know all of you would, um, just to be, to recognize that with the teacher saying, no, you're swamped. And if you don't even have a meeting just to say, is there any way at some point we could decide, well, just a little powwow to keep them engaged, um, you know, and something like that. But, you know, maybe having, you know, trying recognizing that they are overloaded, um, you know, and trying to just have something on the calendar for the fall if they can swing it. Right. All right. Another question from Nacha is uh, for elementary age kids, is there a best time for their exercise in order to help with virtual school? You know, the, in this yeah. case, son is six newly yeah. diagnosed so they're just trying to get you know the treatment plan and figure out he's he's really struggling but they're yeah. trying to figure it out i i it, no one asked me in the in any of the schools how to structure school and i i usually you know with my humility i don't like give major opinions but i have lots of opinions that i would have loved to have been asked about um but one thing would be and this would be an incentivized kind of thing to just again with those micro movements consider having in between and just it's just one minute whether one minute of push-ups one minute of one minute of um you know one minute of jumping jacks one minute of yeah. jumping up and down squats one minute of burpees one minute in between the switch um to just do that to get the blood pumping just running up and down the stairs to get the dopamine going to do that and reward it that day just having that mini boot camp in between i at this point i think the exercise is so important whenever it would be ideal to have it during the school day and having those movements and then right after school and before homework having some movement because they've been in a screen all day and get outside and exercise um but that you know that would be that would be great but i think we got to take what we can get in that in between i'm trying to challenge the kids that i see in my practice to do 25 of something between each class as fast as they can um because it's amazing how strong you can get with doing that if you do it in between but, but I think it has to be incentivized. Right. There's a question from Amy, and she says, my 10-year-old is constantly overwhelmed and very melodramatic about her workload. Any tips for presenting her day in a way that doesn't overwhelm? You know, a big, the big schedule and the way now that they're more responsible, the schedule yeah. becomes daunting. Well, I, I think having a talk, and I, I missed how, how old she is. 10. 10. Just, I think, again, from the get-go, talking, just saying, just like my looking at that mom's schedule, I mean, I was like, oh, I'm just never dishing it out to you again, but just like that was just hitting me, even though it was really well done. And it's just so much to see, to say from the beginning to, to your kid, just, you know, when you look at all this, it's so hard. And you could even write down your whole day with work. If I like write out mine, it's like, huh. So remember, all of it seems too much in it one thing at a time so having the discussion make the implicit explicit it's like all of it looks like so much we're doing one thing at a time one thing at a time so that you've had the discussion before and then when it's like i can't do it i can't do it. it's like one thing at a time one thing at a time. just again like a politician saying the same thing over and over again but just but recognizing that all of it is too much to look at school home all merged together way too much and that one thing at a time that is too much for our brains and you can lay out how it is for your work too, and that it's all too much you have to do step by step. 
Another question from Tammy is, what's the best way to handle the impulse control challenge um, challenge kids who flip onto video games in the middle of classes and punishing hasn't seemed to work? It's okay. This is where, you know, I talked about like rising occasion Churchill stuff, but it's just horrible. I mean, just, just, just horrible. The fact that they're with the screens and then they can just flip to that. And we can't just, I don't want parents having to watch it all the time. I am the last person to ask about how to have controls on the screen, but I understand from every patient I practice, I even tried to hire out, I have one of my high schoolers who was the wizard at always sneaking everything to be a consultant to other parents to figure out how to have self-control. And he said that some kids could even figure it out beside him. I would do one's best to try to limit it through your technology and through control so that it can only be one screen and not go and have the other stuff disabled. I'm again, not the one to ask for that, but I, I understand that on some systems, it's simply impossible to do. Um, so one thing would be, and this is to, to this is, you know, to try to, it would, would require consulting with whoever helps you the most, whether, um, you know, ever helps you, whether doctor wise or, you know, therapist or behaviorist is how to be able to have consequences in a way that already is planned ahead for when you do see the gaming happening, how that's going to take away from gaming at other times. Um, but that requires planning it ahead in that multimodal behavioral plan. Chad, I cannot recommend enough their parent training guides. And I don't know if they've updated a parent um, training guide for the pandemic. If they did, I'd love to take it myself. Um, but because I bet they would have some crazy awesome pointers in that way. But bottom line is it's just so, so hard. And you're doing the best you can, trying to be aware of it, trying to put controls over it, trying to make consequences from it. If you're doing it during school, not going to get it later. Um, but I, I just think it's extraordinarily hard. And to dish out some advice that somehow you just need to do this and it'll be easy, I think is a bunch of bunk. Right. Uh, there's, there's a question from Allison. And it says, we've been having an, an asynchronous day once a week in our school system, which has been very difficult. So the lack of instruction, uh, it's overwhelming to the child, especially when compared to synchronous days. We also face now in our school system with the choice between continuing all remote or moving to the hybrid, which we all know has been an issue. The benefit of hybrid is that our child needs the social um, development, but yes. it will increase to three days of asynchronous learning. Any suggestions on accommodations that they can request? Oh, that's, well, that's so hard because that, that one does depend on the kid. But some points that will help you you, I'm sure you've thought about this because all of you know this stuff already, but since you asked the question, I'll answer. Um, is that in weighing that decision of the hybrid versus the synchronous asynchronous, um, if the asynchronous days are just brutal, then adding more of them could be a really you know, hard outcome decision. So that's, that's where for some families, when they really twist my arm to help them make the decision for them, I've said, if they can swing, it also depends on what parents are doing during the day, um, and if it's even possible, um, that this having more synchronous and not having the free for all Mondays, I mean, it just like, this has been the fourth or third Monday and it's just so hard for so many families. Um, it just becomes a fighting with video game days. Um, then, then the synchronous makes more sense. Um, now, for kids that are getting more depressed from being at home, or kids that just aren't going to be able to connect with other people outside of the school, or kids that need to have relevance of a teacher in their face so that they want to do the work more, then of course the hybrid model is important. So those are the things that I weigh. It's just how miserable is the asynchronous? How lonely? How is someone an only child? How, how hard is being so isolated? Do you have a ton of kids and it doesn't, not as much or a ton of kids in the cul-de-sac, um, other things that they can do since some of the sports have started um, where they can have connection. Um, so I think that's, that, those are the two things the way that you probably thought about already, but I just, the asynchronous has been so rough with, with in the past couple of weeks. And I don't know why I didn't expect that. I somehow thought it would be a catch up day, but it's been the thing that is brought up now every single visit. Um, and one of the things to add to that particular question was that the child seven, 
Oh, yeah. So it makes it a little trickier and less responsive to, you know, motivation and instruction directly from the parent. So that, that's where the, if it's, you know, that's depending on the circumstances being at school could really make a huge difference because it's more relevant than through the screen than just like watching National Geographic, you know. Now there's another question from Kathleen and it's kind of hitchhikes onto the IEP question before, but my son's IEP was amended for virtual learning but I'm not convinced that they're getting the same time, which I think we all realize they're probably not getting the same time, but yeah. You know, how do you, how do you push for that or fight for that? Or, you know, you don't want the, your child to fall back more. You don't want to fall back more. So you, so you bring it up again with the, I'm sure you're fully aware of this. Um, there's a, there's a line that is psychiatrists that in my training we learned, um, uh, that is like a Jedi mind trick of a psychiatrist is um, when we say, I knew you'd want to know um, because it makes people's defenses go down. Um, it assumes the best of them. So when you talk to the IEP team or the teacher and say, I knew you'd want to know that it seems like something's got lost in the sauce here of this you know, pandemic that not getting the hours and of course, as you know, and I need want to know that it's just harder this way. And so we wanted to speak up because I, I bet that you didn't realize this because then it takes away the defenses. Exactly. Exactly. Um, Patricia asked, is there any way to freeze, Charlie, switching subjects here, is there any way to freeze or control the screen on the computer so that while they are receiving instruction, they don't, do not open another window where they are using Google or Facebook? So who else can answer that? Because that's that is as as we watch from me setting up my screen, not my area. So is there anybody here, especially? I could respond to that for the iPad. Wonderful. It has a screen time feature, which is extremely detailed, and parents can, um, in addition to doing everything with a passcode, they can set the number of minutes per application per day. So it's very detailed either by category or individual app. Unfortunately, I haven't seen any such thing on regular computers or PCs, but the iPad's very detailed. Oh, wonderful. That's great. Thank you. And you've also gotten several thank yous. Oh, that's nice. Saying that the information's been very helpful and you help remind people that they're not alone dealing with these issues, which is the most important thing, which is why we're all here. Because it's a system of support. They're not alone. Um, and somebody just keyed and guided. Oh, I guess that was maybe that was who was just speaking. Guided access on the iPhone or the iPad. Maybe that has as a control mechanism. On your computer, you can use self-control apps and or whitelist. You can also set the time and the block the website on the website so that they're not allowed to, that that they're not allowed to use or use the accessibility features on your computer. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody else said, I use a Wi-Fi accessory that can block or limit certain sites on the laptop or iPad called Circle. Mm -hmm. um, just to echo, asynchronous days are tough. Thank you very much for the great session. Any other questions? Anybody has any questions that they want to uh, present? Dr. McCarthy. So we want to thank Dr. McCarthy for this amazing lecture tonight. We will be sharing her slides and this presentation has been recorded that we will send out to all of the participants. Thank you everybody for attending. Thank you so much, Dr. McCarthy. My pleasure. Be nice to yourself. Thank you.